moments. That old saw, money makes the world go round, isn't entirely correct. Actually, gravity made the world go round back when it was forming out of a bunch of hot interstellar sludge. But money does make big picture science possible. Yes, that's obvious, but no less significant for that. And while our production is run on a shoestring, even laces cost something. So I hope you'll help us to keep the episodes coming. It's simple. It will only take a few moments. Bring up bigpicturescience.org on your browser. Click on the obvious button, and voila, more episodes of Science Radio. Oh, and by the way, your donation is tax deductible. Yep, still is. When my computer freezes up, I think fondly of my reliable Rolodex, popular sometime before computer databases and after stone tablets. Yes, your desktop might be a sea of paper, but the dog-eared cards of the Rolodex were an island of organization. Alphabetically arranged, those cards held all kinds of information. Names, addresses, stapled business cards. Information was literally at my fingertips. Plus, it was a trivial task to add, remove, or change cards. Now, imagine the Rolodex concept applied to DNA. Locate genes, add, swap, or remove them. Easy peasy. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, the powerful editing tool CRISPR lets us make precise edits to the DNA of living organisms, bacteria, wheat, fish, even humans. And it's taught us that DNA is a great storage system. It was the discovery of viral DNA tucked into ancient bacterial genomes that led us to CRISPR. Meanwhile, scientists have learned that 98% of our genome, once dismissed as junk, holds valuable genetic treasure. Find out what other surprises lurk in DNA and how CRISPR is poised to let us tinker with and even permanently overwrite our genetic storage system. This episode, DNA, Nature's Hard Drive. Call it a chemical recipe book, uh, life's shop manual, nature's blueprint. Well, use what analogy you will, but birds would not sport feathers, porcupines their quills, or you that unsightly nose hair if it were not for that twisted molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is an incredible information resource. It carries all the instructions necessary to build the organism, including human beings. And it's long been appreciated that it could be the repository of other forms of information. We'll look at the surprising ways the molecule is a repository, beginning with the most speculative. The idea was inspired by an experiment of genomicist Craig Venter, who was a pioneer in sequencing the human genome. His team created some strands of synthetic DNA and inserted them into a living bacterium, which dutifully followed the coded instructions. Physicist Paul Davies. Uh, so uh, human beings have no difficulty in uploading information into DNA. And so that raises the question, might ET have got there first? Might there be hidden messages or codes or trademarks uh, within the DNA of terrestrial organisms? And that's a field known as genomic SETI. Earth's biota figured out this process long ago. Viruses, for example, those deceptively simple bioforms, a slip of DNA encased in a protective membrane, are arguably the original stealth coders. One type of virus, the retrovirus, uses an enzyme, reverse transcriptase, to convert its RNA into DNA after entering a host cell. HIV is a retrovirus, for example. Paul Davies, physicist and director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University, asks a provocative question. Could aliens have used something like this to reach out across the cosmos, inserting messages in DNA, kind of like messages in a bottle? Well, it's interesting to consider how you might upload information into DNA. Now, Craig Venter and other synthetic biologists do it with clever lab equipment. They've got the bugs literally under their noses. But the question is, could it be done remotely? Now, there are things called 
retroviruses. And in fact, when you look at human DNA, a very large fraction of it is in effect viral DNA. Our ancestors were infected by viruses, uh, retroviruses that can inject their own DNA into that of the host organism. And this accumulates over time. So it is possible for information to enter the genomes of organisms through viruses and maybe, who knows, uh, other carriers of DNA. And it's not too far to speculate that maybe uh, one could spread through viruses or perhaps something customized a bit more efficient, spread DNA around the galaxy to upload, infect, if you like, in, in a way that would be relatively harmless, um, this DNA into the host organisms. In other words, then, this is another way of proving that maybe somebody is out there. If you found such a message from the standpoint of uh, whoever's sending the message, let's say some putative aliens, uh, what, what are the advantages? I mean, I guess one advantage is you don't, unlike the usual SETI approach, you don't have to count on somebody having a receiver tuned in at the moment that your signal arrives. Right, there are really two fundamentally different approaches to SETI. One is to assume that some extraterrestrial civilization is deliberately beaming messages at us. That is that they know we're here, they guess that we would have equipment to pick up their message and they're directing it to us. Hello Earthlings, we've got news for you. The other is some sort of scattergun, indiscriminate approach, like a beacon uh, or a lighthouse. It's uh, not directed at anybody in particular. It's there for anyone who happens to uh, look in the right direction or tune in in the right direction. Uh, another analogy might be the message in the bottle. When you, you're on a desert island, you put the message in the bottle, throw it into the sea. It's not intended for one individual out there, just anybody who stumbles across it at some time in the future. And I like to think of messages in genomes as being a little bit like the message in a bottle. Uh, the message is not uh, written in words, it's etched into the four-letter alphabet of DNA, and the bottle is the living cell or uh, accumulation of living cells. The great advantage of implanting a message in cells is that they replicate and replicate and replicate, so they multiply for you. It's not just like the message is in one cell somewhere on Earth. We'd never find it. It could spread across the whole biosphere. I have to say that there is a downside to this, which is that natural evolution, which occurs through mutations, are going to degrade that message over time. And so you either need some very clever biochemistry to stop it degrading, or you need quite a lot of redundancy in the face of that inevitable genomic noise. Now, on the one hand, it sounds like if somebody had infected, if you will, some organisms with this information uh, some time ago, then there might have been plenty of time for it to spread to essentially all organisms. And that suggests that if there's a message from aliens that visited this planet, I don't know, 100 million years ago or whatever, that it would be not just in my body, in the body of the guy next door, but it would be in E. coli and, you know, gazelles and everything else, right? Uh, it's entirely likely that it would spread. Uh, remember, what we'd be dealing with is some very clever customized package that could have properties that terrestrial biologists have not yet discovered. So it could be done very efficiently. What I like about this whole genomic SETI idea is that uh, genes are being sequenced anyway. This is part of a massive program. This stuff is free on the internet, and it's a simple enough matter to search it. Although all of these ideas, everything in SETI, of course, is highly speculative, uh, I, I'm always in favor of doing those things that really don't cost very much money. And it seems to me that we can search through these expanding genomic databases very simply and if there is a message in there, it should stand out in a rather obvious way. There's no point in burying a message so deeply, so cryptically, that people like us are not going to spot it. So it should leap out at us. Well, how could we find it then? I mean, it sounds like what you need to do is uh, sequence a, a bunch of organisms and then put some grad student to work looking at those sequences, but what would they be looking for? I'm sure you remember Carl Sagan's novel Contact and the movie of the same name and there the aliens draw our attention to their existence by having a simple mathematical sequence, prime numbers. Uh, if you search through a genomic database and saw a sequence of primes, 
doesn't have to be very many, uh, that would certainly stand out because we can't think of any natural mechanism that would generate something of, of that nature. Or it could be a repeating pattern. This is a little bit harder because there are natural processes that duplicate chunks of genomes. Uh, so you'd have to be a bit more subtle about that. But basically, you could write a search algorithm pretty quickly. I once gave a lecture on this stuff at Microsoft, and I said, well, you guys could probably figure this out this afternoon. Go do it. And did they? <laughs> as far as I know, they didn't. At least if they did, they haven't told me. <laughs> okay. Well, so, you know, it's hard to speculate on uh, what aliens might be interested in doing. But what would motivate them? I mean, I'm trying to think of a reason that they might do this, because you've likened this to putting messages in bottles and so forth. But I noticed that the Europeans didn't seem to put a whole lot of messages in bottles uh, in the 1400s, just in case there was somebody on the other side of the Atlantic. And for their part, the Aztecs, the Incas, they didn't seem to do that either. Why, why would the aliens be interested in sending messages that might not be open for 100 million years by people who couldn't get back in touch with them? I think the motivation behind doing this would have to be uh, similar to the motivations people attribute to extraterrestrial civilizations for any SETI method. Uh, why, why would they bother? That's a real headache because uh, when we come to motivation, we tend to think of our own species. It's, uh, then you're trying to figure out, well, would an alien civilization have the same priorities? Why would they care? Why would they bother to do this? And if we're dealing with post-biological intelligence, some sort of uh, machine or designed uh, system, uh, it's even harder to discern what their motives might be. And so I sort of take an attitude to this, which is that if it's easy to do and doesn't cost very much money, we can't even begin to guess why or who uh, or even how. Let's just take a look maybe the answer then will be buried in the message that we find. Uh, they will tell us why they are bothering. Now, let's say that uh, this coding has been done by, well, by whomever. The human genome, I think it's got about four billion base pairs, you know, A, G, T, C, you mentioned that. So two bits of information per base pair. In other words, the entire human genome would fit on a DVD. And if the aliens are only using part of the genome, you know, maybe the junk DNA, well, by modern standards, that's not a lot of info for their message. Do you think, Paul, they might just better put a bunch of thumb drives underground somewhere? <laughs> the advantage, as I already mentioned, of using uh, biological organisms to encode your message is that they replicate and spread. If you leave a literal message in a bottle, it's not going to survive for very long. There are genes in your body and mine which are three billion years old, uh, so uh, it has extraordinary staying power. So the great advantage of doing this biologically is uh, it's set and forget, and, and you know that what you have set could endure for millions or even billions of years almost unchanged. So I think it is a very, very good way of leaving a message. Paul Davies, thanks so very much for speaking with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Paul Davies is director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University. He mentions that prime numbers are a giveaway if you were to find them. Why is that? And remind us what a prime number is. Well, prime numbers are simply numbers that can only be divided by themselves or by one. For example, a three is a prime number, right? But four is not because you can divide it by two and you get two times two. Now, prime numbers are obviously an interesting mathematical concept, but the point is that if you were to find prime numbers, a string of them in, uh, you know, some DNA somewhere, you'd say, look, that's, that's obviously not biology, that somebody knows a little bit of mathematics. When the human genome was sequenced, the public responded with collective admiration, followed by a less enthusiastic, that's it? we learned that only 2% of our genome coded for our all-important proteins. 98% of our DNA didn't seem to do anything. Well, that must be a mistake, we thought. Surely a species that can develop anti-dandruff shampoo and eat a burrito in text while driving requires more hereditary complexity than a measly 2% of all that DNA. And yet there it was, spelled out in glorious A, T, C, and Gs, the small pieces of useful DNA 
we're floating like tiny boats in an enormous sea of genetic gibberish. Well, fortunately, researchers rescued us from our ego-wounded funk. They discovered that the so-called junk DNA was anything but. It was valuable genetic treasure containing, among other things, the regulatory function to turn genes on and off. Identifying surprises that are tucked into the once-dismissed dark genome is the goal of researcher Yin Shen, a member of the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, or ENCODE, a research project set up by the U.S. National Human Genome Research Institute. Yin, the dark genome is a great term because it sounds like there's something mysterious there, there's something undiscovered. It reminds me a little bit of a dark matter in the universe, and in that case, that's what's holding the universe together. What is the dark genome? Really, you know, if you look at your body, you have trillions of cells, and every single cell is having the same genetic blueprint. However, you know, different cell type could function differently. That is because they express different sets of protein or genes. How does the, for example, the neurons in the brain function differently from your muscle cell that makes you, you know, working and running every day is a mystery. So it turns out it is the part that is not coding for the protein where we call dark genome contain the instruction to tell the cell to turn on specific sets of gene in a specific setting so that you know you can achieve the ability to be functional on a daily basis. So these genes that make up the dark genome or the 98% of our genome have regulatory function. They're the ones that decide when genes turn on and off. So could it be that they initiate your immune system or turn it off or maybe the genes might regulate the activation of a certain disease or protect you from a certain disease? Is that what I'm hearing from you? That's right. Is it true that a large portion of our genome and, and perhaps a large portion of this dark genome is viral DNA, a, accumulation of r retroviruses? Yes. Well, they may actually make up about to 45 to uh, up to 50 percent of the human genome. These are retroviruses that at some point entered our DNA, and now they're there, and what are they doing? Um, so most of these virus sequences are being silenced. Obviously, you know, it's important to silence virus sequences, otherwise they will keep replicating and insert, randomly insert out to, into our genome. There are, you know, actually a few cases where this virus could be activated and inserted to the genome, and then this could become the driving force for evolution, uh, you know, helping species, organisms to gain specific trains and could be either advantage or disadvantage. Well, finally, Yin, it sounds like it is time to retire the phrase junk DNA. In fact, I think it was retired a long time ago. It just doesn't describe this vast majority of the genome. No, especially, you know, nowadays we can easily sequence in everybody's genome, but we were only having the ability to explain to individual what's the function of one to two percent and we really need to you know further understanding what the rest of 98 percent of the genome is doing and how can we interpret these sequences better so that when we have the full genome sequence for each individual we can tell them if you had a genetic variations in this region are they going to be functional are they going to be pathological what are the biological consequences of having these genetic variations in the dark matter of the genome. Yin Shen, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. Yin Shen is assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at the Institute for Human Genetics at the University of California, San Francisco, and a member of the ENCODE team. Well, with all that junk DNA actually having an essential function, there may not be room for aliens to insert their messages after all. But maybe we could insert ours. Next, how CRISPR is poised to rewrite genomes. It's DNA Nature's Hard Drive on Big Picture Science. The air, the air is everywhere, but often it's bad air, polluted by mold, allergens, bacteria, and airborne chemicals. 
Indoors, air can be as much as five times worse than outdoor air, and it's not so good outdoors. So if you're an allergy or asthma sufferer, you probably have an air purifier. But frankly, the technology of your HEPA style filter, that dates back to the era of the Sherman tank. Molecule is a big improvement. It doesn't just try to capture pollutants, but destroy them, even the most microscopic. And studies have shown that this has real benefit for those who have put up with allergies and asthma for a decade or more. One customer even said that she was able to breathe through her nose for the first time in 15 years. Molecule's technology has been personally effective and verified by science. But most important, it's been tested by real people. Molecule has already helped allergy and asthma sufferers around the country better cope with their conditions and significantly reduce their symptoms. Want one? As a Big Picture Science listener, you can get $75 off your first order by visiting M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot com. And at checkout, entering the promo code Big Picture. Breathe free with Molecule. DNA is a repository for all sorts of surprising information. Sections of the genome that were once thought to be inert turn out to be active. And the idea that aliens could have inserted messages into DNA, is, it's speculative, but it's provocative. However, from a bacterium's perspective, retroviral DNA sequences inserted into their genome would be considered alien invaders. The discovery of how bacteria defended against these intruders led to the gene editing tool CRISPR. Scientists had identified in ancient bacteria clusters of A's, T's, G's, and C's that surprisingly read the same back to front. Between these palindromic repeats were segments of retrovirus DNA, invaders. The odd palindromic segments were part of the bacteria's clever defense, helping to mark unwanted DNA. We knew the bacteria were onto something, and that was just a few years ago. Today, CRISPR is a powerful, popular, and surprisingly easy way to reshuffle genomes. Back when I started my PhD, CRISPR, you know, I could read everything that was published about CRISPR in a week or two, and now it would take me a week or two to read everything published in one day. Biochemist Sam Sternberg worked in the laboratory of University of California Berkeley biochemist Jennifer Doudna, who spearheaded the discovery of CRISPR as a biomedical tool. Dr. Sternberg is now off to Columbia University to start his own laboratory. Briefly stated, CRISPR is a tool that makes editing genes easier and more precise. Think of the CRISPR-Cas9 system as having a homing beacon that directs special molecular scissors to cut DNA threads. In nature, bacteria use these scissors to cut the DNA threads of invading viruses. Now a new tool, Cas13, has been developed to make edits to RNA as well. Meanwhile, the technology is being adopted in many areas, from agriculture to therapeutics. One dramatic development, the use of CRISPR to help make the transplantation of pig organs into humans possible by removing dangerous retroviruses. Dr. Sternberg is co-author of the book, A Crack in Creation, Gene Editing, and the unthinkable power to control evolution. In a technical sense, if you have the power to rewrite DNA, we are controlling the natural mutations that would typically happen because we can now design and implement our own mutations. If you look at some of the work being done in agriculture, in, in human therapeutics, and some of the potential work that could be done in the future in human embryos, in a very powerful way, CRISPR gives us the tool to really change genetic code not in a way that would affect things growing and living today, but in a way that could be passed on to future generations. And that is a pretty profound thing. I'm struck by the phrase, CRISPR gives us the ability to introduce mutations. And you're thinking of mutations from uh, an evolutionary perspective, a change, a change in the DNA. So when you say CRISPR can introduce mutations, what do you mean from the perspective of biotechnology? Well, I mean, mutation broadly as just a change, as you said. So, you know, mutations can be associated with disease. Mutations can also um, be gain of function. So something that would actually lead to some phenotypic or trait improvement. So let's say in the world of agriculture, there could be a mutation that could actually inactivate a gene, 
but inactivate a gene that's involved in oxidation, which leads to fruit turning brown if it's left exposed to air. So there are, you know, biotechnology products like the Arctic apple or mushrooms that have been edited with CRISPR where genes are mutated, but those mutations lead to actually some trait that might be more desirable to humans. You know, the word mutation itself is very general. It doesn't need to be only deleterious mutations. It can be gain of function, loss of function. Well, let's look at CRISPR as a tool with great benefit to help edit genes, the genes of bacteria, of wheat, of rice, of fish, of humans. You've named some of them already. Could you give us an idea of how editing the genome of these organisms, you could, just a, an overview, if you will, uh, will have practical and, and beneficial application? You know, I think a lot of people like me are most excited about human therapeutics. So CRISPR and other gene editing technologies give us you know, the chance to think about treating disease in a new paradigm where instead of dealing with the symptoms and trying to, you know, prescribe and, and design drugs that one might have to take every day if you live with a genetic disease, could you use CRISPR to actually correct the mutations at the level of DNA and remove those mutations that cause disease in the first place? So there are a number of companies now that are working to develop gene editing as a strategy for eliminating mutations associated with cystic fibrosis, sickle cell, muscular dystrophy. And then in the world of cancer, um, CRISPR is being used in a slightly different way, but editing immune cells in a way that would soup up their ability to hunt down and kill cancerous cells in the body. So that's a new form of cancer therapy called immunotherapy. And combining this cell therapy with CRISPR is hopefully going to give researchers a much more powerful way of, of engineering these kinds of cells. You are starting your own lab at Columbia University in, in 2018, your own research lab. How do you plan to use CRISPR in your research and in your laboratory, your new laboratory, and do you have specific projects in mind as, as you begin? Yeah, so actually one of the things I'm really excited about, I mean, certainly I'll be involved with some gene editing applications, but when I started working on CRISPR in Jennifer's lab, you know, we were excited about understanding adaptive immunity in bacteria and really exploring all these diverse and very powerful and interesting enzymes that are critical for CRISPR's function. So Cas9 is, of course, the most famous of them because how it's been used for gene editing. But it turns out there are many more enzymes that have yet to be investigated or characterized. And I think Cas9 may just be the tip of the iceberg. We've already seen examples in the last few years of new enzymes that have other kind of innocuous names like Cas12 or Cas13 that are being harnessed for new kinds of biotechnology applications. And I think there are going to be more of those out there. Now, you mentioned the different enzymes that are now coming to the fore that we're recognizing. One of them is, is Cas13. Now, Cas9 was the one that was associated with the original CRISPR. I wonder if you could compare the two of those because the analogy that I found useful, but I don't know if it's accurate, is that Cas9 as an, as an enzyme was like, if we remember the old Photoshop mm -hmm. tools, was like using the scissors and Cas13 is like using the pencil. So it can perform more precise edits. And I see you get a, a smile and shaking your head a little bit. So maybe you can refine that. But the idea is, what is the difference between those two editing techniques? And in the end, how will it help us edit genomes more effectively? Well, let me start by commenting on what they do in bacteria. So both enzymes are what we call nucleases. That's the name for an enzyme that cuts some kind of nucleic acid. Cas9 is a nuclease that cuts DNA. So they're both molecular scissors in the sense that they both cut something. Cas9 cuts DNA, Cas13 cuts RNA. Um, so in that sense, they're both like the scissors in Photoshop. What's a bit different, and the reason the pencil analogy has been used, is if you think about now putting those into a human cells and what effect that would have on the cells, Cas9, if it cuts and edits DNA, that's going to be very permanent, right? Every time that cell divides, if there's been a change introduced with Cas9, that change will be propagated into every daughter cell. Cas13, if it's making a change in RNA, I guess you can think about the pencil analogy because that's more temporary it will change something in the cell where that edit happened, but now take Cas13 out of the equation and go down a couple cell generations and that change 
is no longer present and the DNA is still the same at the end as it was at the beginning. So there's some idea that as an editing tool, maybe there are certain applications where you'd rather have a transient change in RNA um, instead of making a permanent change in DNA. When you talk about the permanent change um, using Cas9, well, it'll be passed down to the other cells because it'll be replicated. Will it be passed down through the generation? And do you need to edit a germline for something to be passed down to the next generation? Or is editing an adult cell enough to, to pass it along? No, you're absolutely right. So when we talk about organisms, so multicellular organisms like a mouse or a monkey or a human, if you change the DNA of a what's called a somatic cell, so a body cell, let's say cells in the blood or muscle cells, those can have a, an effect on the organism's traits or phenotype, but they wouldn't be passed on to any future generations because they're not present in the sperm or eggs that are used in reproduction. Germline editing refers to the use of gene editing in germ cells. So that could be in sperm or eggs, or it could be, let's say, in an embryo, where if you change embryonic stem cells in the early developing embryo, those are going to eventually differentiate and turn into sperm and eggs. And so those would not only affect the DNA of that resulting individual or organism, but also any future organisms that it procreates. On the subject of editing germlines, you authored an article in Science that proposed a moratorium on editing germlines. As you said, that's the DNA and, and eggs and um, sperm cells until the implications could be discussed. And I'm wondering what the status is of editing human embryos. The Chinese researchers tried it a couple years ago. It didn't work. More recently, Oregon researchers claimed they were able to do it. Those claims have been cast in doubt. What is the status now of editing human embryos with CRISPR? So there's, there's certainly active research that's ongoing. And that's one distinction we drew in that science uh, paper a few years ago is you know, I think it's certainly far too early to be thinking about a clinical use of germline editing. So editing an embryo that would ultimately be implanted into a female. But, you know, there are many researchers using it for research purposes in embryos that are not going to be implanted. Um, yes, I think there's still some question about exactly how it's how it would be effective. But it hasn't happened yet successfully, as far as you know. Not for establishing a pregnancy, no. So in Oregon and in China, these were these were embryos that were edited and then sacrificed, you know, after a couple of days and then analyzed to see how well what the efficiencies of the editing procedure were. I wonder if we could talk pigs for a moment. <laughs> sure, let's do it. Well, one dramatic example of how CRISPR might be used has been the research recently in making pig cells retrovirus free so that pig organs can be transplant friendly for humans. Okay. This is this has been uh, this is work that is ongoing. These organs are not ready to be transplanted into humans, and yet there were some strides that were made toward this. And I wonder if you could just give us an overview of this research, just basically how CRISPR was used to take out retroviruses and make these pig cells safe. Yeah, so so actually our own genomes also have many retroviral DNA fragments. So some that are active and many that are kind of relics from past infections that occurred over, you know, evolutionary timescales. Um, the concern with retroviruses in the pig genome is that if organs were transplanted and those retroviruses were still active, that they could actually cause sickness in humans um, because they might spread from the organs from pigs into resident human cells. So what these researchers did is they used CRISPR to inactivate not just one or two retroviruses, but actually dozens of retroviruses. And I think from you know, a, a technical perspective, it's pretty ingenious approach that, that the researchers in George Church's lab took to accomplish this because it demonstrated that you can do this multiplexing quite easily with CRISPR. You know, I think that's certainly only one of the requirements that will need to be met for xenotransplantation to become a reality. I don't profess to know a lot about the others, but I think, you know, there are big concerns about organ rejection and, you know, cross-species compatibility. But CRISPR does add yet another tool to this problem. And, you know, I think there's a lot of excitement now that xenotransplantation could become a reality in the next decade or so. 
Well, finally, Sam, I wonder if natural DNA is on its way to becoming an artifact and that it will no longer be shaped by evolution, but become wholly a human creation. Mm, it sounds cool, but I don't see that being reality anytime soon. But first, it doesn't need to happen soon. But are we on the way to creating DNA that was fashioned entirely by human design and imagination and no longer by evolution? You know, I don't think it's anytime soon that we're going to have a human walking around with an artificial chromosome that was built in the lab. Um, that's maybe never going to happen. And if so, we're talking tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand years. But it's certainly an exciting time that, I mean, especially with the emergence of DNA sequencing and DNA synthesis and now DNA rewriting or DNA editing, it, it gives you this impression that there's almost nothing out of reach. Well, Sam Sternberg, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us and good luck with your new research lab at Columbia University. Thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun talking. Sam Sternberg is an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics at Columbia University and co-author of A Crack in Creation, Gene Editing, and the Unthinkable Power to Control Evolution. Well, it's early days for CRISPR, but the ethical questions are already being asked. Some of those coming up. It's DNA, Nature's Hard Drive, on Big Picture Science. CRISPR is a powerful tool for tinkering with genomes. Sure, evolution does that too, but it is intentionality that distinguishes the human manipulation of genomes. We are captains of a ship and we have a destination in mind. When CRISPR was first introduced, there was a flurry of predictions about how we'd use it. From creating fuels with bacteria to eliminating genetic disease, the early promise of CRISPR suggested that a purposeful and pragmatic genetic overhaul of organisms was just around the corner. Has CRISPR lived up to that early promise? One opinion, yes and no. Most people, when they think about impacts, don't think about research tools. They think about drugs, designer babies, modified mosquitoes, other kinds of results. But as a tool, its impact has been really impressively swift and dramatic, widely adopted very quickly. I'm Hank Greeley. I'm a law professor at Stanford, where I direct Stanford Center for Law and the Biosciences. CRISPR may be easy to use, but the ethical questions about its applications are not. Should we be able to engineer genomes any way we want? Should we add genes for intelligence or curly hair or remove genes for genetic disease? How about tinkering with ancient DNA to bring back extinct species like the woolly mammoth? Dr. Greeley considers those questions and scenarios that might have unforeseen consequences, however straightforward the choice seems. For example, Stopping the spread of malaria by using CRISPR to reprogram the pests that carry the parasite would seem like a no-brainer. Who doesn't want to be rid of irritating and occasionally deadly mosquitoes? Yeah, to me, this is the most interesting and exciting and nervous-making part of CRISPR. It's changing the biosphere around us uh, and particularly using a twist on CRISPR invented by a very clever guy at MIT named Kevin Esfeldt, or at least he was one of the main inventors, called Gene Drive. Gene Drive is a way of making CRISPR much more effective than it otherwise would be in any sexually reproducing species. So it's conceivable that if you've got a species with a short generation time, like, say, mosquitoes, you could change the genomes of all the mosquitoes in California of a particular species in the space of a couple of years. And it could be that nobody would ever notice. So the clever thing about the malaria story, it's not changing malaria. It's changing the mosquitoes that carry malaria so they don't get infected by malaria. And if they don't get infected by malaria, we don't get infected by malaria. But the idea of gene drive, if it worked, would let you change the genes of sexually reproducing species enormously faster than any other way we know of. Well, inevitably, Hank, that leads to the uh, the whole matter of designer babies. 
And, uh, you know, when you talk to uh, the public about the idea of, well, would you want to engineer your offspring, you know, their first reaction is very frequently, no, I don't think so. I don't want to do that. But on the other hand, if you say, well, what about, you know, precluding various diseases, inherited diseases, they're all for that. And then if you say, what, what about for $50 more? You know, they get the looks of, uh, I don't know. <laughs> some, Seth like, Shostak. Yeah, well, yeah, they make that $30. Uh, but, yes. You know, uh, I can hardly imagine this could be resisted. But on the other hand, this is a very controversial idea. My view on it is a bit of an outlier. I don't think it's likely to happen soon, and I don't know that I think it's going to be very important. And Here's why. If you're designing babies, if you're doing gene editing either on the embryos or more likely on the eggs or, and sperm that, you, that give rise to the embryos, you're introducing a new set of risks. And we really care about risks to babies, to human babies. We don't care about risks to mosquito babies. And we don't care that much about risks to cow babies. We do a little bit, especially for dairy farmers. But for the most part, we really care about human babies. So if this worked 95% of the time, but 5% of the babies ended up disabled or early deaths, that's a terrible thing. We're going to check this for safety very heavily, so it's not going to happen anytime soon. The other reason I don't think it's going to be common is at least for disease purposes, you almost never will need it. Almost everything in terms of preventing disease that you would want to do by changing genes, changing and editing an embryo, you can do by selecting embryos. What people worry about more than the medical side, though, is the enhancement side, that we will use it to make super babies. The problem with that is, we don't know anything about how to make super babies genetically. You know, we know how to make babies that are smarter and healthier by early nutrition and early health and vaccination and so on. And we know hundreds, literally hundreds or thousands of genes that when broken affect intelligence, but they all make the intelligence very low. We know effectively nothing about the genetics of being smarter or stronger or taller or faster or better at math. We have a few early tantalizing clues, but we're a good 20, 30, 40 years away from being able to put those into effect. So I'm unusual in thinking that we're paying too much attention to the designer babies. We've got decades to worry about that, and too little attention to the designer mosquitoes, which could be on us now. One of the things that bothers me about the public attention on modifying the human genome is this sense that somehow there is a human germline genome. Well, in fact, there are 7.3 billion different human germline genomes, and it changes every generation. It is a moving target. Whether it makes a difference if it's moved because of random chance or it's moved because of human decision is kind of hard for me to see. It's, people say, well, how do you know we're wise enough to modify our own DNA? We don't have to be that wise. We just have to be wiser than random. Let's talk about some of the uh, interesting ideas that uh, possibly have mixed bag consequences. You know, bring back some extinct animals. Everybody's thinking of Jurassic Park. Sounds like fun. Would it be fun? Well, personally, I think so. Uh, yeah. But I may be an outlier on this, too. I, Jurassic Park's out of the question, I think, uh, because DNA just doesn't last that long. Um, even Cretaceous Park, which is more recent than Jurassic Park, is 66.4 million years old. We have successfully sequenced DNA from creatures that are half a million years old, 500,000, maybe as long as 700,000, but the DNA itself begins to fall apart over time. So we don't have the blueprint for uh, Stegosaurus. But we do have the blueprint for the mammoth, or for the cave bear, or for the giant ground sloth, or for the American horse, horses evolved in North America and then went extinct here. Uh, we have those. We could, in theory, use CRISPR to try to bring them back or something like them back. Uh, there's a group called Revive and Restore that's funding some research on bringing back passenger pigeons, modifying the DNA of a, a living relative of the passenger pigeon to make it more like passenger pigeons. The heath hen, an extinct little largely ground-dwelling bird from the East Coast is another candidate for de-extinction. Those are likely to be easier to deal with, though less sexy than woolly mammoths. But 
CRISPR makes that more possible by making the gene editing cheaper, easier, and more accurate. Is there anything about this uh, that worries you, though? I mean, there's always, you know, the unintended consequences. It it sounds like a sci-fi film and undoubtedly would be at some point. But, you know, you bring them back and then they wreak some sort of unexpected havoc. Sure. There there are two things that worry me a lot. uh, And why I think we need to focus more on the non-human uses than on the human uses. The human uses, we worry about humans. It's well-regulated. It's well-controlled. People have malpractice suits to worry about. Mothers want safe kids. Uh, but for non-humans, we don't have those kinds of constraints, and our regulatory system is not very strong. I worry about unintended consequences of well-intentioned changes. So in essence, whether you're trying to bring back an extinct species or just modify a current one, modify mosquitoes to make them not carry malaria, that's a great idea. But what else might those mosquitoes do or not do? What other changes might they make to the ecosystem? They are, in a sense, an exotic species. It's like bringing in kudzu from Asia or bringing in the starling. There are hundreds of millions of starlings in the U.S., They're not native to North America. A Shakespeare fancier in the 1880s decided every bird mentioned by Shakespeare should be in America. Mm. So he released 12 breeding pairs of starlings in Central Park. And now they're a pest. So, you know, life is hard to control, and the unintended consequences need to be watched and monitored. The second thing that worries me is the intended consequences. This makes biowarfare somewhat more plausible. If, for example, you wanted to try to infect people with smallpox, as far as we know, the only places with active smallpox virus are CDC in Atlanta and a lab someplace in Russia. But we know the smallpox genome. We know the mousepox, horsepox, monkeypox. There are thousands of different pox viruses out there. We know their genomes. Take monkeypox, CRISPR it to make it more like smallpox, and you've got yourself a biological weapon. The good news is bio-war is hard. It's not just about having the pathogen, the disease agent, but it's about delivery systems and protecting your own people and a bunch of other things. But CRISPR makes it somewhat easier. And you don't need 50 highly trained people working in a lab for six months to make this work. You need a guy with a garage and a 1000 bucks and access to monkeypox. Well, finally, Hank. This, uh, this technology, it's obviously moving fast. It's hard to follow all the developments. Uh, are there any sort of upcoming developments that you can foresee here that you think uh, would be particularly significant or relevant things that we should be looking out for? One of the interesting side issues about this is the patent fight. Because there has been a huge patent fight between Harvard, and MIT, and the Broad Institute on one side and the UC system on the other it is possible that the patent fight might end up slowing down the adoption of this technology uh, or limiting it in in ways that could be uh, harmful. That's something to watch for. There are two things to look for on the technology side. One is continuing incremental improvements. So uh, to use the, the idea of paradigm shifts, CRISPR is the paradigm shift, and now you start tinkering with it to try to optimize it, make it better, make it faster, make it cheaper, make it more accurate. And all that is going on very, very quickly right now. The second issue is to see if somebody changes not just the second part, but the first part. No longer uses CRISPR, but some other method. Humans didn't invent CRISPR. Bacteria invented CRISPR three billion years ago. There are a lot of bacteria out there. They've had a long time. They've probably come up with ways other than CRISPR So CRISPR is the breakthrough. It's the move into this new continent, and the new continent is going to be explored uh, by better forms of CRISPR and maybe by things that do the same thing as CRISPR now that we know how that works but aren't technically CRISPR itself. So I'd watch for those. Hank Greeley, thanks so very much for speaking with us. My pleasure. Hank Greeley is director of the Center for Law and the Biosciences, chair of the steering committee of the Center for Biomedical Ethics, and director of the Stanford Program in Neuroscience and Society.
Well, what we're hearing in the show is that DNA is a great storage system, and it has surprised us with what it has stored, from these regulatory segments in our own genome uh, to the ancient viral DNA in bacteria, and from which we developed a tool that now lets us add new information or remove it at will. Yeah, and I have to say, to me personally, it's quite surprising that uh, CRISPR has come along, because if you'd asked me 10 years ago, hey, look, you know, DNA, nature's hard drive, yeah, sure, but it's read only. You can't write onto it. And now it turns out not only can you write onto it, but it doesn't take, you know, an arena full of complicated equipment to do it. And so this really does, I mean, it changes the whole ball game. Well, that's right. And even though the technology is still on the brink of making these changes, the ethical questions are already at the fore. As Dr. Greeley pointed out, there are many of them, and we need to stay alert to these big questions about how we want to use this tool. He doesn't seem to be terribly worried about that, which also uh, was a bit of a surprise to me. You know, designer babies, that's a, that's a pretty hot topic, and yet that didn't seem to concern him so much. Uh, he points out the possibility that we'll run into unintended consequences no matter what we do. We've talked about, you know, killing malaria by making mosquitoes resistant to certain uh, parasites. And, and, and that sounds indeed like, like something you would, of course you'd want to do it. But he points out that every time you tamper with biology, almost every time it seems, you come up with something you didn't expect, which shows how complicated the ecosystem really is. The other thing that is interesting, the big picture perspective, is that we began this with a discussion of Paul Davies' idea that perhaps aliens are using DNA as a way to uh, carry messages throughout the cosmos. And that seems like a startling idea until you discover what it is we're posed to do with DNA, which is at least as dramatic and also contains an intentionality. And so we want to think very carefully about what our intention is. Yes, indeed. Well, I, uh, I, I, I hope we do think about it. I guess that's all I would say. Thanks to the duo who seem to have production talent right in their genes, senior producer Gary Niederhoff and operations manager Barbara Vance. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the asteroids and comets of our solar system. And big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called DNA, Nature's Hard Drive. And if you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, well, you can download them to your own hard drive, and you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because your kid brother reprogrammed you to want that, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. 